Welcome. I hope everyone's having a great Thursday so far. Thank you for joining us. Hi, everybody. We're happy to have you all here today. Um, some people will join in later, that's fine. Um, uh, and some people will be watching this via recording as well. Um, but welcome, if you're joining us at our Montessori Town Hall for the first time, we're happy you're here. We host these every single Thursday throughout the school year um, as just a space for Montessori leaders to come together and discuss important leadership topics. Oftentimes at the top, you can't discuss everything with your staff. So it's nice to have a, a free virtual space where we can ask questions and we invite different thought leaders and other administrators in the Montessori space to come and share their expertise. Um, today, we are joined actually by the second time by one of our um, own community members, Joanne Chango. She's the founder and head of school of the Montessori School of Rochester, located in Rochester Hills, Michigan, and co-founder of the Global Montessori Network. Um, she's here today to talk about kind of a tricky subject. Um, it's addressing and working through um, conflicts with your staff or just in the workplace in general. This happens at every school, so it's important to just have those strategies ready when those problems do arise. So Joanne's going to be sharing that with us. And if you have any questions or comments, feel free to utilize the chat. Um, this is very much collaborative, so feel free to ask, um, comment as we go along. I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Joanne so she can share her thoughts and strategies on today's topic. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Camille. I appreciate uh, being here, being welcomed in, and I always love the opportunity to support fellow colleagues uh, around the country and the world, as is or may be the case. So working with uh, our colleagues, our team members, our staff, I tend to refer to my my team as a team. And so that you'll hear that language more than staff from me. I think it's really important. Uh, a, a colleague outside of the school environment had mentioned to me a few years ago, it was about 10 years ago, that uh, to change, he invited me to change my language. And from that point, moment on, I started calling my team a team. And that set the mind that that creates a mindset for us in working with our collaborative team members. It is they don't belong to me. They're not my staff. They're a team. We all work together. Without them, we don't have a school. And uh, without the school, they don't have a job. So it's a collaborative team. And inside of those teams, we have different roles and those roles are designed so that we can support each other in a unified attempt to support the children in our schools. So first and foremost, I invite all of you to move towards that language of teams versus staff. Uh, but please know that that's how I'll address them throughout today. Working with our teams over the past 12 years working at the school, I have the Montessori School Rochester. We're actually currently opening a second campus a few miles away from our current campus. And we have a team of over 50 individuals that work in administration, leadership, and inside of the classrooms and in lead and assisting positions. So it's a rather large school with a large team. And we've had many conflicts over the years and how those conflicts evolve and resolve themselves really has to do with leadership. And what I've noticed uh, for myself and tools and strategies that I think are the most effective uh, have more to do with our own personal mindset. It has to do with whether we are being activated or not. It's really important to know, regardless of what anybody is saying to us, they are not doing anything to us. They're not even saying it to us. When people are activated, when they are in some type of emotional overwhelm, we have to make sure that we are not activated by that overwhelm. If we're going to resolve any type of conflicts with any team member or parent or child, uh, but particularly with team members, it is important to not also be activated. The only emotion that I am, that I allow myself to feel in any of these situations is love. That's really the only emotion that belongs there. Uh, because of that, I'm not getting activated. I'm not feeling anxious. I'm not feeling overwhelmed. I'm not feeling worried. Uh, and therefore, I'm not reactive. 
because I, I don't want to be reactive in any situation. It's really important that we are in action, that we are able to collect data just like we do in our classroom and to be, well, one, to make certain that our team members know that they're being heard and two, that then I can be heard when I do have a response. That's a hard thing to do because we're all human and we're made of different emotions. And so if I feel myself being activated, whether it's a sense of urgency or anxiety, uh, frustration, any of those feelings, I simply ask my team member for a pause. I say, thank you so much for sharing this information with me. It's really important and I need to take the time uh, that is needed to digest it and come back to you with a solution or to reignite the conversation at a later time. That might be in 20 minutes. That might be in two days where I schedule that appointment or have my assisting team member schedule that appointment. But I really urge everyone to heed this advice because what I know in my own experience is the times where I don't recognize in myself that I have been activated, those are the times that despite all good intentions, things go awry. And so it's it's really important to remove that. We are observers, we're trained observers. That's what we do in the classrooms. And that is what we need to do in conflict with any team members, whether that conflict conflict is about something with administration or a conflict that they're having with a parent, a conflict that they're having with an, a fellow team member or a conflict that they're having outside of school that's affecting their productivity in school. So taking that time and making sure that we're not activated. I hate when good intentions go awry. I just had a Facebook post that in my memories that shared like seven years ago, I wrote, I hate when good intentions go awry. And I just know that that was about something that happened in the school. I don't remember what it was, but I know that that was about something that happened at the school. And those good intentions usually stem from emotion, right? We, we're, we're trying to do something, uh, yet we're still in re reaction and we want to be active. We want to be proactive. So this is when you're in a situation of conflict. What I also recommend though, is how do we set up an environment that reduces the possibility of conflicts and setting up your environment so that voices are always heard uh, rather than bottled up. I was talking to a student and I said, it doesn't matter how much you want to hold something inside. It's like a pressured bottle, you know, that's carbonated. That pressure gets too big, it's going to explode. The, the, the job of that bottle cap is going to ultimately fail without intent. And that's what we want to make sure doesn't happen in our teams because our most precious resources are our students. We have to take care of them. And therefore, we all as a team have to be our most effective inside of the school environment and particularly in our classrooms. So how do you set up that environment? First and foremost, it was the language of being a team. This was something that I didn't just decide. I mean, I did, but I then had conversations with our teams. We are a school that does professional development regularly. We do probably between 40 and 60 hours annually at our school. And we take a delayed start one morning a month, which I was terrified of. I thought parents are going to go berserk if we have this delayed start. Turns out they didn't go berserk. They knew about it in the calendar. They got the calendar three months before school started. They could prepare their schedules. That was transformative for our teams because we were able to all touch base at least once a month where we could sit down for an hour to an hour and a half, uh, depending on our start time. And we could 
talk about things that are going well, what's working well, what's coming up. Uh, we could do professional development. We could talk about things that were happening in the classrooms. My professional developments are all based on what's actually happening in the classroom. They're not planned out a year in advance. They're really planned out on what am I seeing in the classrooms? What am I seeing in stress levels? Or what am I seeing that is successful? Or what are people coming to me and, and asking me for? And so we don't plan them out 12 months in advance. Uh, it's really based on the climate and the culture that's happening in the school. This also addresses or reduces conflicts. But having that touch point uh, once a month, we're able to talk about things things like language change. That's that's what I addressed to them. I said, you know, for so long, I thoughtlessly used a word that's common in society. You know, we have a staff and we have an administration and now we have a team. And in that team, we have leadership. And then we have different levels of leadership and giving that acknowledgement and that respect for all of the teams. So we have fully like the highest level of leadership, which would be myself and our director of operations. And then we have the next level. We have our curriculum directors, our education directors. And then we have another level of leadership, which is the leaders of the classrooms. Then we have, you know, the lead guides. And then we have another level of leadership. Who's our leaders among the assisting team members? Who are our leaders amongst our, our extended day? So we have leadership and we have teams. And that in and of itself starts to build a cohesive culture where everybody realizes that they're dependent upon each other and that everybody has a voice because in all teams, you know, not one person can win a basketball game. It takes the entire team. So that changed our culture. Having these monthly meetings also allows us to address concerns. So what's working well and what needs change? What is a uh, complaint with request for change? And those get to be addressed at those meetings. A complaint with request for change is kind of a must do in our community. If you are giving us a complaint, we would like to hear some ideas that you might have as solutions. And to have certain ideas for solution, and I will use something very simple, the red stapler doesn't work. So we want a new stapler. The stapler doesn't work. This red stapler does not work. It just keeps jamming up and it wastes my time, wastes everybody's time. And I said, well, what's your solution? Well, I found the silver stapler from Staples and it's $12.99. Like, okay, thank you. That doesn't mean I have to take the uh, the solution that they've offered. Now I get to look at the team and say, does anybody else have issues with the red stapler? And everybody says, no, the stapler's working just fine. I say, fabulous. Who feels like they are most successful with that stapler? Can anybody give a tutorial to me? Because I always jam the staplers. Um, can anybody give a tutorial to the person that's had this request for change and uh, walk them through it and see if that works? Then I'm also making note, please come back to me if the red stapler still is unsuccessful for you, okay? Sometimes I'm taking their, 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 their request for change. They've given me a complaint. They have a request for the change. It's very thoughtful and laid out. And we're now saying that sounds like a great idea. The key is they're not the ones that have to implement it. They've given me a great idea. Leadership is the one that's now putting that into, into a into an action plan. And sometimes we create steering steering committees for, for these bigger issues. So absenteeism is a huge issue at my school. It's really hard on the heels of COVID. Uh, as our team members keep saying, COVID's still not gone, right? People still get COVID. The crisis, big crisis management portion, portion of it feels gone. Our schools aren't shut down anymore. We're not wearing masks anymore. The majority is not wearing masks anymore. It feels like it's gone, and yet it's not. There's still lingering anxieties. There's still fears. People call in for a cough. I'm like, for sure, you know how to cough into your elbow, right? Like three years ago, like we were champions at teaching people how to cough into their elbows and still show up for work. Now people are more likely to stay home. And so that was a really big conflict because we want to support our teams. And yet, and the people that are allowed to stay home are appreciative 
but the people that are feeling the loss in the classroom are suffering. And the same person that appreciates it when they get to stay home are frustrated when their team member stays home. So complaint with request for change and and I was the one that initiated that one, <laughs> so uh, which which is valid as well. I'm part of the team. That resulted in creating a steering committee. We needed a steering committee, people that were going to work together. They were going to address our current absentee policy, how it adapted and changed during the COVID crisis. How is it working? What needs to be changed? And now we meet every other week on Mondays so that we can create a brand new policy to implement for the following school year. Just by creating this crisis plan or this action plan and steering committee, we were in action. People felt like it was going to be addressed and we realized that it wasn't something that had to be addressed immediately, even though it felt like an immediate crisis. I mean, 10 people gone a day in a team of 50 is really hard. It's really hard. That's 20% of your team that's not at school. This is a big conflict. And teachers feel overworked at that point. Uh, they feel underappreciated. They feel inept because the team isn't cohesive and the children, the trust that's involved in cultivating the classrooms with the children is compromised. So normalization is not quite as reliable in the classrooms. It felt immediate. I wanted it fixed immediately when I spoke with my leadership team. How do I, how do I implement a you know, complaint with request for change, because I'm the head of school. How do I do that without people thinking like, oh, and so I talked to them about it and I did, I wanted it fixed immediately. It didn't have to be fixed immediately because the anxiousness about it, the frustration about the team members not being there was reduced. And now we have time to look at it in a more diligent manner so that we can really advocate for real change and therefore increase our school culture and our uh, the culture and the communication between our teams. So uh, going that route is highly recommended. And there were multiple parts with that, right? Having that once a month where you all can sit and talk, uh, the teams feeling like they can vocalize, including leadership, that we can vocalize when there is a, a complaint or a request for change. And then the action plan and creating a team that can all work together with the removal of emotion so that we can actually focus on uh, what what is what isn't and what could be so that we can we can improve our culture what happens though when there's real conflicts when there's real conflicts inside of the school environment and people are feeling really big emotions that often can break apart teams and cause, well, cause emotion versus logic to overwhelm the whole school. We've experienced this numerous times uh, throughout the school year. Uh, so part of our commitment was to reduce the likelihood that these big things occur, uh, and yet sometimes they still do. And that usually stems from some kind of big emotions. How do you leave your baggage at the door? That was something that my trainer, Joyce Frugé, really hammered into all of us 30 years ago, that you leave your baggage at the door. So if you're having a hard time at school, or like I was a student at the time, so if I was having a hard time at university, or you're having a hard time with your family, whatever the case might be, a bad drive, you know, somebody in front of you ran a red light, you still leave that baggage at the door so that you can be fully present for the children. If that baggage is from inside, you're frustrated with the team member, you collect it, you take it outside, you leave it at the door so you can be fully present with the children. When that doesn't happen, your emotions uh, start to become really big. The team members might start to feel frustration, um, lack of appreciation. They can feel anxious 
and it starts to compromise. And one of the things that, particularly in a school environment, that I think many team members are inclined to do is offer commiseration. And I personally feel like commiseration is the death of any team. Uh, commiseration is not actually helpful. Commiseration tends to bring more people, suck more people into the negative emotion. And the nobody really tends to feel better. More people just tend to feel more and more frustrated or upset or scared, anxious, overwhelmed. Empathy is different. Offering a listening ear and offering support. And so building the tools within your team to distinguish uh, between empathy and support versus commiseration is really valuable and important. A team member wants to say to somebody who says, this parent was so rude to me, they didn't blah, 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 and they're really upset. And they're feeling underappreciated by this parent. And they're complaining to somebody, to a team member, and that team member says, I can't believe they said that to you. You are like the best teacher. And they're going on and this person saying, yeah, I have a right to feel this bad, right? Like, I didn't deserve this. And that starts to snowball. And it becomes, did administration do anything? How could they even let this happen? And da 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 da. And now two people are upset about it. And then possibly three. And administration didn't even know what happened, right? So now there's a lack of trust with the administration as well as a frustration with the parents. And so when they're coming to us and we're humans, they're saying, how could you let this happen? We, we're at risk of being activated as well. Whoa, whoa, I didn't do anything uh, versus practicing that pause. So we've trained commiseration out of our schools. Commiseration doesn't help. And if we can't train it out of our schools, if there's somebody that is deeply anxious and is just seeking justification for their feelings, which is what commiseration is offering. And if you have justification, then you don't have to release it and you don't have to fix it because somebody else is hurting you and therefore it's their problem. They need to fix it. You're no longer an agency of yourself or your role inside of the school. So we really truly try to educate uh, commiseration out of the school. And instead we give real, real tools. So somebody might say, I can't believe they spoke to you. You are just the best. You don't deserve to be spoken to that way. This is all commiseration. Uh, how do you address it? And the, some of the language that we've offered to our team members that I'm here to share with you is things like, that must have really felt awful. Do you want to talk about what actually happened? Okay. It sounds like you handled that really well. How are you feeling now? And now we're putting that person back in agency and we're still saying of themselves and we're still saying that shouldn't have happened. That, that must have felt awful. There's a full acknowledgement of what they went through, but we're, we're keeping them in their driver's seat and we're bringing them out of the emotion to be able to go back to observation. Let's look at this clearly and let's see how we're going to address it. And they might figure out a way to address it themselves or my teams know I've got an open door policy. Even if I'm not on campus, I have an open phone policy. Anybody can call me or talk to me at any time. And if I can't reach them, if I'm busy with my kids, they get a quick text and say, can I call you back in 20 minutes? Is this urgent? Can I call you in the morning? I have an open door policy because I always am activated in love. I'm just not ever willing to be activated in other extreme emotions uh, amongst my, my staff. If I'm going to feel those emotions, that's the baggage that's outside of the door. I pick that up on my way home. I actually tell my teams, you don't even open your baggage till you're actually on Livernoy. Like you're, you're on the road. The parking lot's still part of school. You're, you're going to pick up that baggage and you're going to open it back up when you're on the road or when you've gotten home. And that's the same for me. So I might get activated at home and I have had to teach my husband to not one, commiserate with me or two, try to fix it for me. I've had to be very clear. I'm just venting. I'm just venting. I have one person at the school that I may vent to. It's very rare. It never happens inside of the school building. And it starts with 
I'm going to apologize. I'm going to vent. And afterwards, I actually say, thank you for listening. I apologize. That was inappropriate, but it was an ear that I needed. So I have my safe place, but I'm also protecting that person. And I'm making sure that uh, we're neither one of us is going to fall into commiseration. This is particularly important with your leadership team, this training of uh, using a respectful voice, not being activated, and handling every situation with through observation and just the dealing with the basic facts is something I coach my leadership team on all the time. It's very easy for me to do with children. Children will say something like, stop it, I don't like it, you know, or he's doing this. And, and I can say, take a deep breath. What you actually want to say is, and I, I can coach young children because we know they're on their learning journey. It's harder with adults. And yet I am really conscious of when my team members are frustrated with each other or with a parent that I don't engage in the conversation until they're ready to only talk about the facts in the conversation. We're going to eliminate and remove opinions and any tone of voice that is snide. And they always, you know, back up. No, 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 I know I mean that, but you know how she is. And like, what I know is she's a parent that, and how did we handle it? And all of a sudden, something that might have gone on for 15 minutes, which is commiser seeking commiseration or gossip, is is a limit it might have been a 15 or 20 minute conversation if we had continued on that path uh, with a solution becoming elusive or I just very clearly and directly turn to them and say we're going to stop this conversation and we're going to start it again what is the actual problem and now we can fully address the problem and the problems are usually really easy. It's everything that clouds the problem that uh, becomes the challenge. And so it goes right back to not being activated. And how do you know when you're activated? Um, that's, that's something only you can figure out. This is a professional development opportunity, possibly bringing somebody in from the outside that, you know, maybe works with, you know, heart's breaths or, or things like that that people can become more and more in tuned with themselves. I know what stress feels like for me. It is starts right back here. I think it's the amygdala. It releases something. And then there's almost this like haze inside of my head. I can feel the haze inside of my head. And that's my signal. I just take a deep breath and I say, I'm going to need 15 minutes and I'll come back to you on this. And I promise you, I've heard you, but I need 15 minutes so that I can I can be present for this conversation. Know your tells, understand yourself, and recognize and believe or trust in your team that they will appreciate your ability to not be activated so that so that you can be more present to help resolve conflicts. We'll go to what happens when you can't eliminate commiseration. Uh, when anxiety or frustration overtakes one or two team members. This is challenging. I never quit on my teams. 12 years of running the school, I think I've only let two people go. Can't even say the word fired. It feels so awful. I two people in 12 years. That doesn't mean I haven't lost team members. Many have elected to go. Uh, many others, uh, we worked through conflicts and we have grown together. We are a team that for 12 years, we've been in school. We have team members that have been with us for 10 to 12 years. The average is seven years. Our retention's really high. Uh, and yet there are times where when these negative emotions really start activating more people that drastic changes need to be made. Some of it is that professional development that once a month that we have that hour and a half in the mornings where we're addressing, you know, social emotional things with our team members. Other times there comes a certain point where you do have to let a team member go. And that isn't necessarily the person that was having the big problem. Sometimes it's the person that thinks that they're fighting so hard 
for that person. And when that, that's a commiserator, that's the person that believes that they're a protector and they've picked up a fight and they are the bigger warrior of this fight. In fact, the person that was initially upset uh, didn't know that they were in a fight. They were just having a bad moment or a stressful week, but somebody else has picked up this fight and they've taken the charge and it's, it's causing unrest amongst the entire, the entire school. This happened to me last year. The person decided I was the problem. He, he's fantastic. He, he's really great guy. He started out as our maintenance person. And he had a lot of stress and anxiety about COVID. And it was really, really big. And we had given him a promotion. We invited him to join the middle school team as the woodshop guide. He had already been doing that kind of stuff, but now he had a title and that added to his stress. So he was feeling really stressed. And another team member who joined us that was young and fantastic, brilliant girl, she kept talking about her stress level and how Montessori wasn't making sense. And that activated him. And he was saying, yeah, because I've been stressed too. And then it was Joanne's not giving us enough support. And when she gives us support, she's just steamrolling us, which I, I don't steamroll. And, but I, I do step in, you know, if, if you're telling me you need something, I can't just say, Hey kids, you must listen to so-and-so. I mean, that doesn't work with middle schoolers, but I can come in and help to resolve the situation and hand the situation back to the team member. But this was just, it was snowballing. It was really, really negative. And my team was shocked at what I suggested needed to happen. And I said, all right, they're saying that I am being disrespectful or inappropriate in the classroom. So come in and observe me. There is nobody, including myself, that could perform for six hours straight. You just can't. So if there's something that I'm doing that is inappropriate, then you need to come in and you need to observe me. And they're like, we already know. And I was like, no, no, no. If anybody else had somebody coming in with this complaint, I would expect us to go in and do our due diligence and our observation so we won't not do that with me. They come in and they do their observation. I said, not just one of you. I want three different people, three different times over a course of a week to be coming in and doing these observations of me. And that let all of my team know, one, that I was part of the team. Uh, two, we had now observers that were coming in and addressing certain situations and uh, or addressing the complaints. And the person that was initially feeling really anxious settled down, but the other person was now on guard. Okay, they've answered it. Everything's fine, but I am going to be the guardian now. And that stress and tension was impacting him and impacting the whole team. All of a sudden, I've got toddler teachers that are saying, is everything okay? Um, you felt really abrupt to me. And I'm like, I, I said, good morning, right? It was infiltrating throughout the school. And it was about some of his own baggage, but it was his response and his need to protect this, this other team member. And then he took it all upon himself. So he's got his own baggage. He's caring for this person. He's now taking her stresses upon himself as well. He's weighed down. And this is a person I love. This is a person that I'm still connected to now, but this is a person that had to come to the decision that staying in this environment wasn't best for him. And we did that together. I didn't fire him. I wasn't going to fire him. Uh, but we did talk about the, who do you see yourself as? Because I see you as this adolescent guide. I see you as this, but who do you see? And then there's the, the next step. What did you hear? So I've had these conversations with the team member before they leave. And this is something I learned recently. Tell me what you heard. Tell me what you heard. I heard you. I heard you. No, just tell me what you heard. And I'll say something. I'll say, okay, I didn't say that. So I'm going to say it again. 
this is what I've said. But since you're hearing this, can you tell me what it is that's making you still hear this? And maybe I need to give emotional support. Maybe I need to give a day off for that person, even though we're still addressing absenteeism. What is it I need to do to help this person find their center again? And sometimes you can't. When that person that is in that guardianship role, like they're, they're the guardian now, nobody is going to be heard on their watch. When that person leaves, and it might be the gossip teller, it might be the person that's so concerned, so they're not as big and brave and strong as, as, as one team member, but they're so concerned that they're going to make sure everybody knows about it. They're going to ask if anybody else is feeling that way. They are going to talk about it and ask somebody for support. I'm only telling you because I just want to know if you have any input so that I can help so-and-so. And uh, that person maybe just really can't be inside of the school and they usually have to come to that recognition themselves. And if they don't, you have to be brave enough to make that decision for your team members. At one point I asked if it needed to be me. Am I causing something amongst this team? that I'm not trying to cause? Do I need to not be here because the school is greater than me? And I had this conversation with my team and people were appalled. I'm like, are we sure? Because this work is greater than me. I can, hum I can humble myself. I didn't, I didn't open the school as a feather in my cap. I opened the school. I'm head of the school because the work of the school is important. When, when you're able to have those real open conversations amongst a team, your team really steps forward and they listen. And then they start becoming solution makers instead of, I don't know, firefighters right? Um, because we're not looking to, to fight fires. We're looking to be solution makers so that fires don't start inside of our schools uh, in that regard. I have more things that I could share, but I think at this point, if there are more specific situations with 12 years in my own school and an additional 20, I've probably come across the majority of situations. And in, in this type of subject matter, I'd be happy to be able to just offer this, uh, my support by maybe talking about any specific situations that are happening inside of your schools, if anybody has a question, and we can kind of go from there. Joanne, can I ask you for one clarification? Uh, yes. You, you had mentioned uh, earlier about uh, having a 40 to 60 hours of professional training. Yes. Uh, that's over an, over an academic year. Is that what we're talking about, the 40 to 60 hours? Yes, it's from middle of August through middle of June. We do between 40 and 60 hours. The first 25 hours, I think, it might be closer to 30, is in the last two weeks of August. That's when we close for summer camp. We close for the school year. We are completely shut down. Nobody is babysitting or offering extended support for our families. The families know they've got those two weeks travel to Italy, go where you need to go, or find family or somebody else to support your children. We're doing professional development as well as upkeeps to the school. During that time, uh, we do, it's usually between 25 and 30 hours of strictly professional development for our teams on a variety of different subjects from licensing to um, uh, first aid and then more Montessori professional development uh, within schools. So that happens then. Uh, we live in a state, I'm in Michigan. Our state requires, I think it's 16 hours of professional development annually. And uh, we commit to 25 just during that, those two weeks. And then we do an hour and a half once a month. And then we have... I think quarterly, we have four other days where we take the full day off and we take those eight hours as our professional development. Our lead guides are sponsored to attend at least one conference 
a year, whether it's a local conference, whether it's Montessori or it's on discipline or positive parenting or whatever it might be, they are required to do at least one conference annually. And then we do additional support and sponsor certain trainings for our assisting team members as well. But just in the hours we designate between the 25 the one and a half monthly and the four days a year where it's a full day, uh, that totals uh, nearly 60 hours uh, most years. Do you, uh, in those, uh, in that time frame, do you also occasionally invite uh, outside consultants to speak on certain specific topics? Absolutely. I think it is 100% necessary and sometimes incredibly humbling to know that I'm bringing in an expert to talk about staff conflict when I might go and speak somewhere else about staff conflict. But the words that you have to share or the, the message that is important to be landed with your teams sometimes need to be heard. It needs to be heard from somebody outside of your team. It just does. It doesn't matter that I'm an expert in philosophy. It doesn't matter that I'm a parenting coach. These things don't matter. Sometimes it's worth the investment in a professional so that the message can be heard. Because when we're in, when our teams are in some form of chaos or they're in overwhelm or commiseration is happening, whatever might be happening, they're not ready to receive it from somebody inside of the team. So you bring that additional coaching person in. That happens periodically. Some are scheduled during that, the summer training that we do. We have different people scheduled to come in. And then during the school year for those quarterlies, we are it's based on what we're hearing from our teams if we bring somebody in or else we, we do professional development, not just with our leadership team, but as I talked about, leadership uh, has many different levels inside of our school. So there might be a lead guide that is doing professional development on a certain subject matter. There might be an assistant guide that's doing professional development on a certain matter. Then we also trade professional development opportunities with local schools. And so I might have a colleague at a school you know, 10 miles away, she might come in and work with our assisting team members. And then I might head over to their school and do professional development on a different subject or uh, the same subject, but we're just going to talk to each other's teams about it. So that's, that's very helpful and always recommended, hard to find in the budget. And yet it is a worthwhile investment because your teams stay for a long period of time and parents are looking for that retention. And if you have, if you're able to say our leads have been with us for three years, five years, 12 years, 25 years, you're going to have retention of your student body as well. And the, the growth of your school and the stabilization of your school is going to be more effective uh, that way. And it's going to grow. That's, that's how we're at a two campus situation now. These sessions that you have, uh, basically you have it all, the entire staff attends at the same time? Yes, because we we shut down during those times. So okay. Okay. the entire staff always joins for any pre professional development. We all start together. Sometimes we split apart and certain mm -hmm. professional development opportunities are geared towards different team members. Sometimes they're for leadership. Sometimes they're for assistance. Uh, more often than not, uh, we are together. Sometimes it's geared towards you know, elementary, and we have somebody coming in to talk about elementary concepts while somebody else is talking about uh, that same concept, but for primary. It is often professional development tends to be geared towards the three to six, and we're like, and this is how it looks for toddlers, and this is how it looks for elementary or middle school, it's, we started to learn when we were hearing from our teams, because our teams, again, felt like they could talk to us was we need to split some of those moments up because it was sometimes a waste of their time to be listening for an hour and a half about content that was geared towards elementary guides and the toddler teams they they're hungry they they want more they want more to learn and do and practice so we started splitting up certain mom moments that way in addition to this you also have your monthly staff meeting 
Yeah, the monthly staff meeting is a combination of professional development as well as you know what's happening at the school. So what's working, what isn't working, what's coming up. Uh, but we always do some portion of PD during that time as well. And I have one final question. I'm sorry I'm taking so much of your time, but just one final question here is um, your suggestions about creating an environment. And I think you mentioned some of it already where people feel comfortable in coming and talking about the issues they're having rather than bottling it up or talking to somebody else rather than talking to you. I think you just, I mean, you did mention a few pointers. But you, can you elaborate a little bit if you have time in terms of what else can one do to make sure that the entire team feels that they can come and talk to you anytime before the problems become, issues become problems? It's creating a culture. It's part of their trust in you. It's hard to say because as our school grew, I, I had an open door policy from day one. So any team member that joined our team, they were told that this was the case. And I was doing check-ins with those team members. I have uh, one team member, she's been with us now for nine years. And every time I called her to the office, she was sure she was in trouble. And I was like, well, what's going on? <laughs> like, it's never in trouble. I usually have something great that I'm looking to tell them, or I just want to share some information. And one day she just sat down. She's like, it's been two years and I still, I'm having a hard time trusting it. The office was always trouble for me. When I was a kid, you go down to the office, you get in trouble. When I was at, you know, when she was at her last school, it was, if you went to the office, if that director called you, they were telling you what you were doing wrong. And so she was always just on guard for that. And I just finally turned to her and said, you've sent your children to the office. Have any of them gotten in trouble with me? And she said, well, no. And I said, I'm just treating them the way I think humans deserve to be treated. So are you going to be in trouble if you come down to my office? And she's like, no. Like, yes, uh, you, you, you're not going to be in trouble coming down to my office. That same team member that was so, she, she had so much baggage that she had brought in from past life experience, learned to tell on herself. Nobody had to ever come and record anything to me because she would come and tell on herself because she knew. And that's what I call it. I'm like, I love it. This team member, she tells on herself because she recognizes in herself, there's no fear. She's able to look at herself and say, this didn't work well. I didn't like what I heard from myself in this situation. This happened. It's not good, Joanne. And she knows I'm here to not say you're right. It shouldn't have happened. What I say is, what can we do differently? Uh, what is it that made you uncomfortable? How will we address it next time? And what do you, what tools can I provide for you uh, so that, so that you can grow in this scenario? Would you like me to come in and observe? Do you want me to work in the classroom? Should we do professional development on it? Whatever that is, but I created that open door policy for them and convinced them that I was trustworthy. Now, as my school grew, which might now be if you are if you guys are trying to change this culture or put this into cult into the culture at your school, when our school grew and I hired two education directors, uh, the education director said, every time we walk in a room, people say that they're uncomfortable. Uh, nobody is sharing with us. There's problems, and nobody's coming to tell us, and all of this stuff. And I was like, okay. And I said, well, just like I can't tell the children that they have to trust the new teacher, I can't tell these team members that they have to trust you. You're going to have to cultivate that within them. So you can do your job and you can stay present and supportive, but it's going to be up to you how you develop these relationships with these team members. And some of that meant that I had to remove myself more so that they could have opportunities to build trust with my education directors. But my team members started coming to me like, we miss you. And I was like, I'm right here. And they're like, but you're in the middle. I was teaching middle school. You're in the middle school. We don't want to take away from you. I'm like, guys, you know, I'm always available and you know what kind of teacher I am. I sit in observation half the, more than half the time in my classroom. You can come and talk to me. You can interrupt me. The kids don't need me. They're, they're fine. And so they had to start believing that having a 
new director of education was an enhancement, it didn't mean that they were losing something. So they can maintain their trust in me and they can build trust in the additional leadership team members that are there for, for their support. So it, it's work, it's creating a relationship and it's an important one. And you have to make sure even as you might create an action plan or you have to do a write-up on your team member that they understand that this is for their benefit. They have to understand that this is for their benefit. I'm protecting you. I'm writing this up because I'm protecting you. Intent and impact are two different things. We're all here with an intention to do good, and yet we're humans and we fail, we make mistakes. And so we have to still examine the impact of any situation, even if the intention was for good. And if we can separate those two things, if the people can hear us and know that I hear them, I know what they're feeling, what they're experiencing, and I trust them, and yet we're still going to talk about the impact, then they don't feel threatened and that fostering of trust, uh, rather than being compromised, continues to grow within your teams. We have a couple of comments here. Um, Elizabeth recommended a um, a podcast, um, Hidden Brain, How to Complain Productively, a great podcast about the subject of commiseration. Thank you for that recommendation, Elizabeth. And then Rachel here shared, our head of school preaches honesty and communication. She also has an open door policy and staff know that they can vent to her if needed. If you need a minute, head to her office and just talk. She will drop what she has um, or is doing because she has our backs. That's great. It's it's the best environment to work in because you know you're going to be able to navigate almost all challenges and come out ahead. Uh, again, because our job is too important. As as teachers, as guides in schools, we don't we we're supposed to be perfect. Parents get to fail right? We can't. Now that's not feasible, but because that is the expectation, then we must cultivate this culture for our teams to be as cohesive as possible and to have as many growth opportunities as possible so that we can reduce failures. Any other questions or scenarios? Thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, she's just shared Going Reptile by Martha Hamilton is a great book regarding understanding your alert responses, short and accessible. And I like both of those. So uh, we, yeah, we, we read this one and we call it our reptilian brain. Thank you, Elizabeth. We call it our reptilian brain. Like why, why, did, why did that come into play, you know? And, but it happens and, to know yourself uh, means that you are more in control of yourself. And when you know yourself and you're in control of yourself, you understand your intentions, uh, you can afford to be humble and you don't have to allow pride to cometh before the fall because you know your intention is to do good and a team only supports you. N nobody can win if the team loses. Any other questions? Thank you, Rachel. Somebody wrote, "I Joanne, I love your hair and the ponytail. Thank you. I'm going gray. <laughs> I've decided I'm done. So I really appreciate that. Any uh, questions or scenarios? I think we have, what, six more minutes, Camille? Is that correct? Yeah, we have a couple more yeah. minutes if anyone has any yeah. final comments or questions. Yes. Tina, just, did you um, put your hair? I did. Thank you. Um, first of all, this has been amazing. I think even just hearing you um, sort of acknowledging what probably every single person on this call is going like, yep, 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 100% have been in similar situations. Um, and I am in one right now too, where 
um, there is someone who's like, you're the bad guy, you're not on my side. And it's so um, atypical from anything that we've been experiencing here. So um, I, I took copious notes. Um, and I think that there are lots of questions that I wanna um, ask from what you've already said. But if you have any advice, um, this person definitely comes from a super emotional place. Um, I'm trying to recognize those emotions, right? Because wh wherever it comes from, it's real. So however I made you feel is how you feel. Um, whatever you think I said, I, I really like that. Now I will be specifically using with her, um, tell me what I said, um, because yeah. it's definitely like one time she was like, oh, you said I was going to be fired. And I was like, oh, wow, no, <laughs> not even close. Yeah. So um, so I'm trying to recognize and acknowledge that she's having those feelings. At the same time, um, you know, there are, there is room for growth, right? There is um there is room for growth. And so whenever I um, am trying to coach, then, um, you know, it, it's, it, she's not seeing the growth perspective, I guess, on it, right? It's just, you don't, tr you don't trust me actually is something that she's been saying recently. Um, when last year there was a trip planned and I asked her how it went and she said, oh, all the kids said it was the murder house that we, where we stayed. And I said, you know, maybe next year you want to have like one of us look at where you're going to be staying first, just so we don't have kids, number one, saying it's the murder house, going home and telling their parents we stayed at a murder house, right? And so then this year it was like, well, I found a place, but I'm showing you all this because you don't trust me to make this decision. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I knew you were going to say that. Um, because as you were offering support, uh, that support could have landed in a way of, uh, if the kids called it a murder house, it must have been, versus something that first offers acknowledgement. So, wow, you worked so hard, and that's what they took from it. Tell me what made it feel that way, right? right. Why, why did they take that? And like, how did you feel about it? Um, okay, uh, so it looks like you still chose a great house. You still had the 10 bedrooms you needed, the, you know, bathrooms that you needed. It was, it was in a great location. I know you're going to find another house that doesn't uh, doesn't feel like the murder house for the kids next year. Uh, but if you want any help with that, just let me know. And you've now given this full acknowledgement. You did a great job. Uh, the kids called it a murder house and you can't help that. It sounds like they're adolescents, you know, they're, they're going to find the, where there's a will, there's a way, way to make anything gory, but you're acknowledging and you're not saying, Ooh, it was a murder house. We'll fix it. Uh, you're instead saying, why, why did they think that? What, what was the house made of? Okay. It looks like you covered all the bases. Were they just being silly? Well, I know next year you'll, you'll do a great job. Let me know if you want me to look at houses with you and she's going to let you know that she wants you to look at houses with you but mm -hmm. we've moved away from any what might feel like judgment uh, as well as away from any commiseration we're just going to the facts you found a house it had what you needed the kids said you know rotten things and how do you feel about next time and it's just direct and to the point. And mm -hmm. she actually feels like she did a good job despite the kids saying that. Super helpful, thank you. You're welcome. Anything else? Here in the chat, um, Robert shared um, a resource. He shared a care form. Um, he said, hi all, thanks for sharing encouragement. Attaches a form created to help process concerns, advice, hope it helps some. Um, feel free to download it. I think you can do that from the chat. Thank you for sharing, Robert. Thank you, Robert. I'm going to try to do that myself right now. Awesome. Looks right, like we well, have about a minute left. Any other last minute questions, comments? This has been a really helpful hour. You're getting a lot of thank yous. Mary said, thank you. Very interesting discussion. Thank you. You're welcome, guys. I love it. I love what I do. And I, I don't like to cry. I don't like to lose team members. 
our team members are so valuable to what we do and they're not perfect and their potential is vast. If, if I'm an excellent guide, then they can be twice as excellent as me. Just that's how I feel about my children. My children are meant to be better than me. Therefore, my team members are meant to grow and become better than me. I will invest in them and they know this. And therefore you can navigate anything and everything, but we have to do it without emotion. The, they don't, they, they, every emotion other than love needs to be eliminated. Uh, you can be determined, but that doesn't have to be an emotion. You can be concerned about the circumstance, but that doesn't have to become an emotion. Those, that feeling of overwhelm will lead you astray every time every time we've had an issue when my emotions take over i feel anxious or somebody's trying to activate me i had a team member that was just like joanne you need to be worried about this and i was like okay so then i'm in worry mode and it's just a hot mess and i finally turned to her and i said don't ever activate me into worry i promise i'm taking it seriously even though you're not feeling my my worry or the overwhelm that you think it needs to be equal to the situation so that you feel satisfied that I'm taking it seriously. I promise I'm taking it seriously. Don't ever activate me again because I fail when I'm activated. And my job is not to fail. And I can feel passionately without being activated because I can be more productive. I'm a solution maker when I am not activated. Thank you, Rachel. Camille, I'm happy to come and talk at any time. I speak uh, and do PD virtually on Zoom, or I travel to different places, conferences, and, and schools and do PDs on virtually anything, anything when it comes to Montessori and running schools. If you've got a problem, I can talk on it and support you and your team. So you can always reach out to me personally on Facebook or through our website, themsr.net and uh and talk but i'm happy to be a host uh to be a guest uh guest host uh with camille and uh, needle marketing at any time well we'll definitely love to have you back joanne um this has been your second time and i think both times that you've uh come and spoken you've shared some really valuable experience and advice so we'd love to have you back in the future i'll keep those topics in mind rachel um we're always looking for suggestions um Vanessa said on team building, how do we invite you to our school? What was the Facebook info to get a hold of you? <laughs> so on Facebook, my my Facebook name is Joanne Yono Shango. You can reach me at the Global Montessori Network Facebook page or group or the Montessori School Rochester Facebook uh, group. Or, sorry, that's a page that you can reach me on. You can also go through our website, which is is the like T H E M S R, so the Montessori School Rochester, the M S R dot info. I'm just linking it here in the chat for the um, that Facebook group. You are awesome. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, thank you so much, Joanne, for joining us. Thank you for everyone who came and asked questions and contributed resources as well in the comments. We appreciate it. Um, we'll be back next week. Next week's topic is going to focus on um, copywriting in the Montessori space. So creating content, structuring your school blogs, writing taglines, creating, uh, writing ads for your Montessori school. So if that's something that interests you, we look forward to seeing you next week. We'll be sharing our um, advice, expertise on content creation um, and specifically copywriting. So writing that content for your website, ads, et cetera, um, and answering all your questions. Uh, so I look forward to seeing you then. Thank you again, Joanne, and um, hope everyone has a great rest of your Thursday. You're welcome. Thanks, everybody. Bye.